Georgia Tech has been very hospitable. You're lucky to have Tom Lux here, who's a fantastic poet and a very energetic advocate of poetry. And it just looks to me like he's doing a, a terrific job for you here. Uh, it's a, an honor to be your guest and his. And I'd like to thank Ginger, too. Everybody's been very hospitable toward me on my visit, and I appreciate it. Um, I'd like to start by reading a poem that's um, 2,700 years old. It's a poem that I translated by an ancient Greek poet named Archilochus, they think. It's not really clear who wrote it, but uh, they, scholars think it was Archilochus. They think it was Archilochus because Ar Archilochus was somebody who was particularly angry at a particular person, and this is an angry poem. Uh, he was angry at a man named Lycambes, who was the father of the woman to whom he was engaged. Lycambes found out that um, Archilochus's mother was a slave and called off the engagement, according to some scholars. And so he cursed the both of them repeatedly, so uh, viciously that they both committed suicide, it said. <clears throat> and this poem, they think, must have been by him, just because the speaker seems so angry. Um, so supposedly this would be Archilochus speaking to his one-time prospective father-in-law. Liar. Swept overboard, unconscious in the breakers, strangled with seaweed, may you wake up in a gelid surf, your teeth already cracked into the shingle, now set rattling by the wind, while face down, helpless as a poisoned cur, you puke brine reeking of dead fish. <laughs> may those you meet Barbarians, as ugly as their souls are hateful, treat you to the moldy wooden bread of slaves. And with your split teeth sunk in that, may you smile then as you did when speaking as my friend. And here, here's another uh, translation from the ancient Greek in a completely different mood, and then I'll move on to my own original poems. This, this one from about six centuries later by a poet named Zonas. The speaker in this poem is the father of a small child, a, a toddler, who has died. And the father is speaking to Charon, the foot, the the uh, boatman who ferries the dead across the river Styx into the other world. Um, Karen, you who pull the oars, who meet the dead, who leave them at the other bank and glide alone across the reedy marsh, please Take my boy's hand as he climbs into the dark hall. Look, the sandals trip him, and he is afraid to step there barefoot. What attracted me so much to those Greek poems is, you know, these things are thousands of years old, and it's as though you have another person in the room with you when you, uh, when you delve into them. So on to my own poems. This first poem, as a transition, has a Greek title, which is Dithyram. It's, it's a name for a kind of very irregular, wild rhythm in Greek poetry. And uh, I think you'll see what wild, irregular rhythm this poem describes as it unfolds. There's one allusion in the poem it might be helpful to mention in advance, which is to St. Cecilia, the patron saint of music. This poem was written as a letter to my father. I was writing a bunch of letter poems 
back then in the 80s. And these poems are from the last 20-something years. Um, but this particular one, uh, when I wrote it to my father, everybody I mentioned in it was uh, dead except my father. My father has since died. And I, I would like to dedicate this reading of the poem not just to him, but also to a good friend of his who's in the audience. When in our living room rehearsal nights, the 29 of you tore full tilt into the soul of Brahms, when Mrs. Stillians hit one note in three on violin with a chokeless scattershot technique of bowing, while stoic Eddie Gus on timpani not four feet past the headboard of my bed kept time to either side of which the woodwinds, horns, and strings betook them unto a different beating each, in each his dithyrambic brain. That was my bedtime. Even before I knew mine was least musical, though loudest of the voices in fifth grade, as in the third year of piano under Mrs. Schwartz, my ear proved, let's say, liberal in pitch and crypto-anarchist in time. <laughs> Yet even then, I knew the music in the next room was miraculously bad. <clears throat> Lately, when I fall asleep to loud accompaniment of Fenton shoe corpse loading dock or garbage men at 3 a.m. or upstairs bashes or the lunatic who curses us by name in several languages for hours shouting from the floor below while Francie whispers her revenge in bed beside me. Sometimes as I drift, I think back to the hostage wailing of a violin a caterwauling horn, or hue in pure tone solo on the clarinet, as if in mid chorales the centaurs were struck dumb to see a unicorn step forth into the broad calm of their clearing. And what comes to seem miraculous these days is not mere chaos, but that they should come together inescapably as you well know, you have the tapes, indubitably bad, and all of them caught up in music. That whole house possessed by salesman, dentist, housewife, minister, by dauntless St. Cecilia locating for 29 lost souls the mortal music Touching on a hectic cheek in her retirement, Mrs. Stillians, even me, my twitching eyelid at eleven while I fell asleep, such racket, the unlikeliest of comforts. May it come whoever calls her, as in my misguided tenor, in good faith, I do, for that I am your son. This poem is called Conjunction, and it remembers an event some of you may remember from a couple of years ago in May of 2002 when the five visible planets were all clustered there on the western horizon right after sunset. It hadn't happened in, I forget how long, does anybody know? Thousands of years, I think. Uh, and the idea of this poem has something to do with the uh, idea in the bestseller that uh, uh, women are for Ve from Venus, men are from Mars. Uh, there's a word in this poem, orrery, which is a word that refers to a model of the solar system, one of those models where the, everything moves around at the right speeds and everything. But in this poem, I'm using it really to describe a mental model rather than a, a physical model of, of planetary celestial motion. Conjunction. 
Venus and Mars were almost touching in the West at nightfall. You blamed me for everything. I wanted you, I said, to disappear. By midnight, in the torpor of my rage, I lay beside you, thinking about our progress in the dark. The planet, spinning wobbly from its orbit with the moon, was hurtling on a leash around the sun, which was behind me underneath the bed. The sun, with Venus, Mars, and Earth in tow, drifted toward Vega, somewhere past the bedroom ceiling. You kept snuffling while you fell asleep, and later, in a nightmare, whimpered. Vega and the sun and local stars were being swept along the Milky Way, which tumbled in the local group of galaxies, while all the groups went flying. Who knew where? I couldn't track two movements in my mind at once, and we were spinning seven movements deep, while in your dream, the children must have been in trouble. Hurt, I thought, your whimpers were so helpless. I gave up my orrery and turned and put one arm around you, and you stirred, but we said nothing. We just breathed and lay awake. This poem has a, a short quote from the prophet Isaiah at the beginning, which goes, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf. Gift. After my mother's father died, she gave me his Morocco Bible. I took it from her hand and saw the gold was worn away, the binding scuffed and ragged split below the spine, and inside, smudges, where her father's right hand gripped the bottom corner, page by page, an old man waiting, not quite reading the words he had known by heart for 60 years. Our parents in the garden, naked, free from shame, the bitterness of labor, blood in the ground still calling for God's curse. His thumbprints faded after the flood to darken again where God bids Moses smite the rock. And then again in Psalms, in Matthew, every page. And where Paul speaks of things God hath prepared, things promised them who wait, things not yet entered into the loving heart. Below the margin of the verse, the paper is translucent with the oil and dark still with the dirt of his right hand. When, when I was an undergraduate, um, and I'm sure Tom will remember this, there were a lot of poems being written about rocks. And uh, they generally tended to present rocks or, or stones, they more often call them, as sort of superhuman cosmic presences that manifested a mystery beyond human understanding. And I really liked this. I, I love these poems, and I wanted to write one. But I'm from Greenville, Mississippi. I don't know if any of you know that part of the country. And they don't have any rocks around there. So I didn't really, I didn't know, mud I knew, but rocks, I didn't know from rocks, right? So it took me a long time to get to where I thought I kind of got the poem that I was trying to write. And, and this is as close as I ever came. It's called Dialogue of Soul and Stone. I was talking to a rock, and I said, stone? I talked to them like that. I said, what makes people feel extraneous? To which the rock, in its own idiom, replied, 
extraneous is ass. You think you got it bad? <laughs> Try igneous extrusion. Try glaciation. Try a little freeze and thaw. Stand out in the weather for 10,000 years. We'll talk extraneous. One thing about rocks, they cut you half an inch of slack, but never. That's why guys like me idealize them. I said, sage, I laid it on a little thick. This rock I'm talking to, it's not much bigger than a chiclet. But I don't want to give offense, so I said, Sage, what should the human species do? To which the rock said nothing, but he got that look. You know they're thinking to themselves, drop dead. This poem has a little epigraph from the Buddhist scriptures from the Dhammapada. Hidden in the mystery of consciousness, the mind, incorporeal, flies away. Attic window. The mind at the top of the attic stair, wheeled in the galactic arms of a snowstorm lit by street lights from below. Under invisible stars, the mind where the air was calm while the snow revolved in the wind outside leaned out, gyroscopically true, vibrating at the top of the stair. This is a poem from my next book that's uh, coming out in April. And um, all of the poems in this new book spin off lines from Psalms. The line that the quote that this poem uses is from Psalm 26. So will I compass thine altar, O Lord, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving. Scrolls. Thine altar is to me this bathtub where my four-year-old twin girls tip back their heads. They close their eyes. I read their faces from above in trust and fear in holiness tipped back until the water line has touched their hairlines. Cautious. Look. Their hair flows underwater like the scrolls unfurled in heaven. This is the last poem I'm going to read. It's, uh, it's from a while back. It's uh, about my son Isaac when he was a toddler. He's an undergraduate now. It's called Fallen Things. Isaac, on a walk, partakes of fallen things which he would eat if I would let him. Shred of leaf and rock and weed and acorn cap and wing feather of desiccated thrush. Whatever creature's fallen in his way, he squats to look. He tilts his head and coos. He plucks it from its place and puts it to the sky to show me, noses it and names it or declines to name it. Here is one more thing to keep in hand or drop or keep until both hands are full and I suggest he slip things into pockets, his and mine, which he likes very much to do and having done it he begins to look around him. <laughs>